to the stage right now. So, uh, would Erian Nergad from uh, Lurai Seafood, I'm sure I'm mangling some of this stuff. You're smiling, so this is not a good sign. But uh, anyway, all of you will know that his seafood company is a, a big player in northern Norway, and welcome to you, Erian. Uh, Abby Tingstat is from the Rand Corporation, specializing in much of the material that is relevant to this discussion. So, Abby, welcome to you. And uh, please uh, also welcome Marianne Sivertz and Ness, who is the mayor of Hammerfest in Norway. So, Madam Mayor, welcome to you too. Please give them all a warm welcome. I think it's fascinating that we, our first uh, speaker, our keynote was from Peter, who is an anthropologist. As he says, his first and primary instinct is to think about people, but in this case, he's thinking about the impact upon people of uh, very significant infrastructure development in the Arctic region. So, in that spirit, I'm going to actually start with you, Madam Mayor, if I may. Um, I won't pretend to be an expert on Hammerfest, but I am aware, and I've been told plenty about um, the major investment made by Equinor in a big energy terminal just offshore. Onshore. Onshore. Uh, well, yeah, Forgive terminal. Me. Yeah. It's a terminal, just on, onshore. And LNG it's, plant. Right. Yeah. And it's a big deal. It is a big deal. It has meant everything for Hammerfest. It meant everything? Deal. Everything, I would say. Would you? That's yeah. a big claim. I mean, yeah. Hammerfest presumably has a long history and a proud history. So are you suggesting that the, the new terminal and the economic activity that's come with it has fundamentally <laughs> changed forever your community? <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Because when I grew up in Hammerfest in the 1980s or 90s, it was uh, much uh, population decline and uh, depopulation. And what was the population? In those days, what was the population? Uh, actually, in 2002, when the oh. government decided to develop Snövit LNG, yeah. LNG, it was 9,000 inhabitants. Right. And we know from the other coastal communities in Finnmark, the last 40 years, there has been 50% um, decline. Depopulation. Yeah, depopulation. Yeah. So what's the population now? Uh, actually, at the moment, we are 11,500. Right, so yeah. it's gone up about 20%. Yeah, but we had the merger with the neighboring communities, so that means a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, uh, what, you mean it hasn't really gone up at all? You've just no, 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 we have 1,500 new inhabitants. Okay. Yeah. So, so you heard Peter's very interesting presentation about the, the need for any major infrastructure development to have real meaningful input from the communities in which it's taking place, which it is impacting upon, and to have impact assessment that comes not just before, but during and after the construction of the infrastructure. Can you tick all those boxes and hand on heart say, yep, we did it right? I would say we did it right, because you know, uh, the, um, my community was really poor, lack of resources, didn't have the resource to deal with all the tasks. And we did uh, also have scant attention from the regional and uh, authorities from the national government. So we had to manage everything ourselves. And that was also our ambition. We wanted to do it ourselves and not let it up to the market or to, uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. So we needed, a, so, uh, very soon we knew that we had to find a strategy to recruitment, how to make people stay and come mm. to our uh, community. We also had to do something with them um, to save, uh, make sure that we had a sounder econ economic basis. Because as I said, we were poor uh, economically and also by when it comes to competence and how to have resources to, to carry out all the tasks. Yeah, so we but had the, 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 sorry to interrupt, but the, the decision makers here, the people driving the project and, and deciding exactly how the project would work, were outsiders. And, and I, I, you know, that's, no, that's the good thing about this story. This is a story about cooperation between local, regional and national authorities, and also between business and employer organizations, and also um, with all the people in the northern parts of Norway. Actually, people from Tromsø, from Lyngen, from all over, girls went saying, we want Snövi. And the elderly people, actually, when there were people from the government, vi government visiting Hammerfest, they were marching in the streets. Mm. We want Snövit. So this is, was a big uh, project for the northern parts of Norway. Mm. And everyone had the same goal. We're going to succeed. This is going to happen. So I think that's a bit of a, uh, how this is uh, such mm. a good story and how this has changed uh, our, my community, but also the region, I would say. And, and when you look at Hammerfest today and... 
you consider some of the things we've been discussing in our debate here about uh, where uh, power lies and the degree to which people in the community feel that they have control over their own economic and social lives has the creation of this major infrastructure project in the midst of the community changed things? Yeah, as I told you, uh, at this one, actually everyone wanted this to happen, but we didn't have any help. Everybody? Well, there was no opposition to this Almost, at all. Almost, no. <laughs> everyone wanted uh, this to happen. I would say everyone. I was, uh, if yeah. anybody didn't want this to happen and who has a stake in this, <laughs> do raise a hand if you're disagreeing. But 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 there were two <laughs> municipalities in Finnmark that didn't uh, support this. Right. And there were 19 at the moment. Okay. Of course, there was someone who was against. But what we had to do as a community, we had to make sure, like I told you, the economy for the municipality. And we put on a maximum property tax. Mm. And in that way, we had um, money from the LNG plant, from the uh, pro mm. project. Yeah. So that's the way we managed to have money to build new school and right. So, so, so and it's interesting. House. So the, the, yeah. the, the, the facility is generating new cash and resources for the local community. It seemed to be working for the local community in that way. Yeah, but it was not that popular because, mm. you know, people don't want uh, high property taxes, maximum, mm. actually. So there were people that was like, wow, are we going to pay this? We don't want this. Mm. But then they were told that, okay, you're going to see, you're going to have better schools, better kindergartens, better uh, elderly center, right. future house. And this is what happened. Well, Hammerfest is a fascinating example. Let, let's broaden this out. Let's talk about, uh, well, let's talk about a very different sort of industry. That, that's all about the sort of creation of a, of a new energy terminal. You are, uh, uh, you're, you're very much a, a fish guy or a seafood guy. Yeah. Yeah. But but you do it on a huge scale. You have deep sea. You have off you know coastal fishing. You process the seafood. You're a big distributor of seafood. So you're a massive player in your community. And I'm just wondering how you ensure that you operate in a way which is sympathetic to the wider needs of the community in which you base yourself. Well. Um First, uh, to Marianne, uh, I know that uh, LNG is the, mo the most important thing for you in Hammerfest, but we are also located in Hammerfest, so, so fish is... Uh, don't forget the fish in Hammerfest. Don't forget the fish, yeah. because when you live on the coast, you can never forget the fish. All right. That's the one solid foot that we stand on. I like that's a kind of Norwegian yeah. mantra, never forget the fish. Never forget yeah. it. Uh, I am from Botsford. I've, uh, I've lived there all my life, except from five years in Tromsø. Well, that's important. So you're a real, uh, genuine local guy. I'm a real, guy. genuine local guy. Yeah. Um, Do you even look like a fisherman? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we always talk about uh, tourism or oil and gas, but the fish will always be there. Well, will they, actually? Will. I mean, it will always be there. I can, I can uh, assure you it will always be Well, we'll discuss yeah. that. Yeah. We've got a meteorologist, uh, and we're going to talk about climate effects, and we're going to talk about uh, stuff that might challenge that theory. But anyway, yeah. carry on. And we can create uh, workplaces from the fish if mm. we do things right. Uh, but we have, to, uh, we have to talk to my job is to buy between 60 and 70,000 tons of fish every year. And I have to spread it all over the year. Yeah. As Marianne knows in her community, we, we have to answer to her every year that the people in Hammerfest have work every day. It's important. The everyday job, not the season. Um, a lot of times we talk about the seasons, but in the fishing, we did uh, the work 365 days. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and Marion also talked about being poor, and the whitefish industry was really poor until Larry, the new owner that bought us, mm. came in. We had a lot of uh, cash from the salmon industry, and now we are seeing a huge change in the whitefish industry. But where, where are the ultimate owners of, uh, sorry, I mispronounced it terribly, but Le Leroy, or Leroy. Leroy. Where, where, you know, where's the ultimate ownership lie? They are in uh, Bergen. In Bergen? Yeah. Right. Well, it's a long way from the north, isn't it? I mean... Yeah, but, uh, you know, um, Lere is a huge company. We are 4,200 uh, skilled workers in Lere. But it's the sum of all the people on the coast. Mm. In Botsur, there are 150 people. In Varanger, I think we have two. 
uh, and Charlie Four Hammerfest all around the coast. Mm. And the sum of all these people is 4,200 yeah. And that's where the ownership is. But it, it comes back to this thing about where the power lies, uh, who makes the decisions, what are the, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the basis for their decisions, who are they really thinking of? You know, obviously they're thinking of the bottom line, they're thinking of expanding their business, building their profit margins. Where do the needs of local communities uh, fit in that? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, the skill and the knowledge of whitefish industry is out there on the coast. It's, it's uh, hope there's no one on my chief's here, but it's not in Bergen. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. in Botsfjord, it's in Sörda. There's the skilled people. Yeah. They're the guys making the money. So, uh, well, I think it's uh, difficult from, for the guys in, in Bergen not to listen to, to Orion. Right. I have done this my whole life. I know not everything about fish, but a lot about fish. I, 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 I'm guessing you do. I'm not going to challenge you on fish knowledge, but uh, wh 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 what kind of infrastructure then has uh, the, the company, I was about to use their name, but I've forgotten how to pronounce it already. <laughs> what, what kind of uh, infrastructure investment have they made in your community, for example? Uh, not so much in my community, because oh. we have 12 different locations around the coast. Right. But Larry has uh, spent several hundred millions in Norwegian crowns on investing in plants and in the new technology. Mm. A new technology is something that we need to change. Uh, we, we are not making money as we speak in, on the whitefish. But with a new technology, uh, it will come a huge change uh, in, in earning money. And of course, uh, we need other workers. We need other skills. And how do you attract these other workers, they, you know, outsiders basically, with, with, with skill sets that you need to expand the business? How do you attract them to your various northern communities? Uh, we start in the kindergarten. We always I'm assuming they're not, not yeah, the kids yeah, actually. No, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> we start to work at five. No, they, they, uh, <laughs> I think I know what you mean. Yeah, we yeah. show them the importance of the work to work with fish. Yeah. Uh, my story is that I've always been told how important the fish is. You, can, uh, you start to work when you are... I started when I was eight, so uh, not five, but I started at eight to, to cut the tongues. And uh, you're always told that this is important for the community. Go out, take your education and come home. We need you back home. Mm. And I think when you do that and you hear, when you've been told this from when you're a kid, you, you, you just want to come back and, uh, and do something for your community. And that's my uh, everyday drive. I want to do something. I want to make a, ch uh, make a in, if it's in Hammerfest or Server or Botsville or Balbo mm -hmm. or wherever, I want to contribute to, to change the society. For the better. Mm. All right, well, that, that, that's terrific. Th you, uh, yes, indeed. Urian, thank you. Uh, Abby, you, you, you are, I think, a bit of a specialist in sort of engineering, am I right? You, you think and write. Technology, yes. Technology and sort of engineering. So uh, you're listening to this debate and, and you look at what's happening in the far north and do you see that, that uh, development, you know, that is uh, infrastructure, plants and energy terminals and all that, uh, is the development taking place in a way that you would regard as, as, as sustainable, long-term, secure, or are you worried about it? So I think that's a very important question. I think we're still working out what sustainable looks like in the Arctic. So yes, I, I am worried about it because I think there need to be more conversations, more plans, more pan Arctic looks, more looks into um, local communities. Um, but I'd like to raise actually the complementarity between resilience and security. Mm. I think these are complementary terms. One can beget the other. Uh, security, I think of as establishing conditions to limit vulnerability, whereas resilience is about making sure that our communities, for example, can address those vulnerabilities. Um, I want to be 
uh, very forthright that I, I think historically our Arctic communities, among others, have had strategies to deal with the vulnerabilities. I mean, I had a wonderful conversation walking around outside over lunch with some um, uh, some people who, who told me that they were pensioners, and uh, I asked them, I said, well, how do you feel about security in your community? And they took me through a series of uh, civil security uh, steps and tips, uh, which I found very useful, and then they remarked that, of course, rule number one is not to stand around on a cold winter day talking with people um, as a matter of uh, civil security, so we, we win our separate ways, reasonably so. Um, but uh, I think very importantly, uh, climate change is in changing and uh, in enhancing, in some cases, vulnerabilities for communities in the far north. And uh, understanding this, I mean, knowledge is central to this, of course. Uh, starting with the communities themselves, which I think has been a recurring theme um, of this afternoon. Um, but, but give me a specific ab about the way in which you see climate change adding to uh, vulnerability or enhancing, increasing it. There are so many multifaceted ways. We have the physical environmental changes, just thinking about um, uh, changes at the coast with permafrost and sea level rise and, yeah. and coastal erosion. I mean, that's just one, one example. Um, we have uh, local economy and culture to think about, uh, resources for law enforcement. Um, what are the new uh, emerging needs for, for law enforcement? Are they, do they exist? Um, and how do we conduct law enforcement? Um, uh, there's also uh, demographic changes to think about. Uh, I think uh, in the previous panel, um, there's a mention of um, climate refugees. You know, these are all sorts of changes that can take place. I, I'm not to say, I won't say that this is, climate change is not without opportunity. I am a glass half full kind of person uh, at times, but um, I certainly think that there are plenty of, of problems to worry about. And um, I want to emphasize too that I think communities are all unique, but in the Arctic, they have two commonalities. The first is that they are on the front line of climate change, and the second is that they will be the first responders for whatever may come, as they have been in the past. And I think we have a lot of questions to ask about how technology not, um, to develop more knowledge, but um, also with um, uh, response capability for um, uh, medical capabilities, which uh, they may be very fine here in Tromsa, but uh, we, we heard about um, Alaska and Northern Alaska, um, you know, thinking about scenarios of what if a cruise ship, um, something happens with a cruise ship um, off the coast of northern Alaska and people require medical attention, how are we going to do that? So it's very, I think it's very important to, to look at all of these things and also think about um, uh, pan-Arctic transportation. What does that look like? Where does it make sense from a pan-Arctic perspective in a way that enhances the resilience of local communities to develop economies, but then also uh, limits or at least uh, enables us to um, put a check on vulnerabilities and how to respond to those. Okay, well, that, that, thank you so much for that. And, and putting this discussion of, of development, infrastructure, uh, economic investment in the context of a changing climate is very important because I, I want to bring in, you know, we have this uh, uh, thing this year where we're having perspectives, outlooks given by uh, people who have a stake in all of this. So I'm going to ask now uh, Bård uh, Fuchstad, who's the Director of Weather Force Forecasting at the Norwegian Meteorological Institute to take to the podium over there because Board is a guy who looks at, at climate trends, who looks at the science in a way that is very germane to this and particularly the, the things Abby's just said about this need to consider the impact of climate change on the kinds of uh, infrastructure investment being made in the far north. So, Board, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the infrastructure we provide and our history of providing an infrastructure. We have actually have an office here in Tromsø for a hundred years coming this Saturday. Um, and we started around 1915 establishing this and the building we got was financed by the good citizens of Tromsø on the ground donated by uh, the town. And in 1930, we became Vädvarslinga, which is the popular name for our institute. Uh, and from the 1st of January, 1920, we were issuing storm forecast. And from the 1st of July, the same year, we were issuing daily forecast to 160 telegraph stations around the coast of northern Norway. And for us, fishery has always been the most important industry in the north. And our mission is to protect life and property. And throughout our history, the most important part has been to enable people along the coast to make good decisions regarding weather. 
And we still have challenges in terms of uh, polar laws that we still endeavor to understand and to forecast in a good way. And there are still tragic events connected to this. And we also need to be present around the Arctic to understand the climate and weather in the northern areas. And we have been on the islands of Bear Island, on Jan Mayen, and on Hopen. And we have been there, uh, and we, you will still find us there, because we are also serving uh, to assist in protecting life. And we have also been there during great political events. We occupied Jan Mayen and the northeastern Greenland. We were there during World War II. And we were also present during the Cold War. Uh, and a major part of us has been in assisting science, research, and we've also been there for historical polar and Arctic events. Um, with thanks from Amundsen. Mm -hmm. And we are still here when it matters. Uh, we have also been in the front uh, runners of using new technology. Telegraph, radio, introduced long distance reporting. And then Norwegian Broadcasting came, and the first thing they wanted was weather forecast. And we have developed from being metrologist and manual label to using supercomputing and processing petabytes of data. And also one of the major improvements here north was in first satellites in 1971. And then we introduced EAT, which is very famous in Norway, of course. To round off, we have been there for 100 years for people and property, but most of all for the people. Uh, and we have been securing civilian and military aviation from 1936. We have been assisting rescue operations. And some of us also lived here during this great snow winter of 97, with two meters or 40 of snow here in Tromsø. And we think we will be here for the next 100 years also. And our mission is still to protect life and property. But now we have the added mission of helping prepare the society for a changing climate. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you. Well, that, that, I love seeing all the old archive and that last thought about, you know, the Meteorological Institute helping prepare society for a changing climate, it just it strikes me, I don't know who wants to answer this, but it strikes me there is a danger right now of a little bit of complacency. We're all assuming that climate change is, is happening, but is also, you know, the, the temperature rise is, is increasingly rapid and we're deeply worried about it. But in the north, it does mean perhaps that investment decisions are being made about, you know, uh, offshore oil and gas exploration or building new transport infrastructure in places that before would have been regarded as too dangerous, too inhospitable. Now there's a feeling, oh, you know what, well, let's go ahead with it because the planet's warming and it'll be fine and actually we need to be ahead of the curve. Do you think there is that danger of, of trying to do too much too quickly when we're still really not sure uh, quite how extreme the weather in the far north is gonna be over the next few decades? Anybody want to take that on? I think it's important to develop uh, the northern parts and the Arctic, but of course going to do it in a sustainable way. And yeah, we have lots of the resources that can contribute, can be a part of the um, renewables. We have the wind, we have the fish farming, which is uh, going to give the world food. And we also have uh, energy. So I mean both food, energy, and minerals, as we also have in my uh, community, will be a part of the renewables industry. But, but you know, again, the thought would be, and, and you talked about security a lot, the thought would be that if you open up northern shipping routes, for example, that's fine, but, but you know, it's fine until something disastrous happens and uh, it's in such a remote place that it's very difficult to mobilize emergency help or indeed, you know, expand offshore exploration, which is fine until, you know, there's a terrible catastrophic weather event and there's a terrible spill or some environmental disaster which calls into question the decision-making process from the very beginning. Do you, do you think we're in a very difficult place right now where it's actually, it's, it's difficult to make investment decisions and it involves a, an element of, of futurology which, which could be dangerous? 
I, I, I would like to add here, first and foremost, we, we should worry about the existing infrastructure hmm. because, because clearly uh, the existing infrastructure was built under very different climatic uh, scenarios right. and conditions. And as I work a lot in northern Russia and there you see dramatic impacts of uh, beat housing roads or any other kinds of... Actually, the, 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 the north of Russia is very heavy in, in um, infrastructure compared to Canada or something hmm. like that. So, so you... you, you you have enormous impacts, and even with, if you mention the tourism industry, you know, even I think that in current conditions, what is happening with some of the cruises up in the high north is actually quite, a, quite uh, irresponsible. And so I think before we even go to the future, the, the question is how we do, do we even deal with the present? Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. And, and I, the, the, the one about tourism and how far to push mm -hmm. expansion of the tourism and how far north to push yeah, it yeah, yeah. Is, an, is an interesting one. You, you were frowning a little bit at that point. Was that just a natural frown or <laughs> <laughs> were, we, were you hearing something you didn't quite yeah. agree with? Well, my former job was as a port director, so I worked a lot with oil. Ah. And when we come to the north and to the Arctic, it's, everything is so difficult because it's dark, it's cold, it's, it's extreme weather conditions. Yeah. But uh, I think we need to dare to do something because it's, when Marianne said there was no one protesting uh, when Snevit was being established, no one will protest because one of our main worries is work. We need work. And we need cash. So it's a lot of talk about uh, I'm, I'm, well, but <laughs> about the environment. Of, um, uh, I, I love nature. I'm well, nature yeah, guy. but I suspect you're going in a direction that some yeah. people in this room will now find uh, a little bit disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. And I want them to put their hands up if they're <laughs> feeling a little bit disturbed because we're not, we don't have much time left. And, and you've just, I think, expressed something very interesting, but, but perhaps May I add a brief point before we... Um... Well, as long as it's quick, because we've got hands okay. up in the audience. I promise it's quick. Uh, just that I think this is causing us to revisit how we plan and also recognizing that even if we have these scenarios that we think are very unusual, mm. um, more often than not, we're just not very creative. And in fact, they're happening tomorrow. All right. Okay, well, now, ma'am, it's your turn. Yeah, finally. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've tried to make this brief. It's very complex. Uh, i try to make it very brief. I fully understand uh, where Peter is coming from when he talks about communities and the needs. So I'm fully in line with that. But I also understand where Arian and Marianne is coming from. Uh, I rem my name is Gunbrit Retter, by the way. I'm with the Sami Council Arctic and Environmental Unit. So, um, but I think we have to keep in mind, uh, Marianne and Örjan comes from coastal towns mm. in, in uh, Finnmark, Norway. And we have to keep in mind that the Sami people are as invisible in those coastal small towns. And uh, we are just scattered here and there and without having any really impact on the development that is taking place. So, when, so what I... What I want to, to try to clarify is mm. that uh, Peter is talking about communities and uh, Marianne and Örjan is talking about communities. And uh, as I said, in the coastal towns, the Sami people are just seen here and there, uh, not having heavy impact, just like at this Arctic Frontiers conference. And um, I want the audience to, now the panel, to reflect upon what each of you understand with the word community. When you talk about community, what is a community? Yes, yeah, well, good. Well, thank you for asking, and I want the panel to respond. <laughs> yeah. Yes, good. Peter, yeah, you go yeah. first. Um, uh, thank you very much, Gunbrit, for that intervention. You know, I think if, if I would have a, a few more minutes, I think I would have tried to clarify that from my perspective. I think because it's clearly an illusion that that community is something homogeneous. You know, sometimes maybe in Hammerfest, uh, but um, but I think in 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 most cases that we are aware of, you know, uh, community consists first and foremost of individuals and and of individuals of, of different backgrounds and as as, as, as as you say when when Sami are in a particular place just a small uh, minority they are still an important presence is an important fabric of the community and I think that's that that's the important thing to keep in mind it's not it's rarely the case that 100 percent 
of a particular place mm. agree on something. And it's not just about majority decisions, because if we have pure, purely majority decisions, then we leave out very important components of Right, but I, I'm getting the impression that the Sami people think that, you know, it, it's too easy to say, oh, you know, people want jobs, they want uh, economic investment, they want the big infrastructure projects, you know, that, that isn't necessarily a perspective that the Sami people would share, but they don't, they don't their voice doesn't matter to you people like you. Of course it matters. And every people that lives in my community matters. <laughs> and we listen and we talk and we have dialogue about everything almost we do. Uh, it's very important. But it's also important, I just have to say, I was starting it and I would like to <laughs> continue because it is not a question of uh, preservation. It is about uh, sustainable development. And we have to do it. We have 11,500 inhabitants in my municipality. If we don't have jobs, they will move. The young people move. And we know the northern parts of Norway, the young people already start moving more than before. So we have to do everything to keep them staying. And we need a diversity of jobs, diversity of people from different parts of Norway, from the world, actually. We have to make a society where people want to stay and come back if they go. All right, but you don't necessarily want to rely too heavily on, for example, fossil fuel uh, industry when whatever one thinks about Norway's use of its assets, the, the global picture is of a decarbonizing world where fossil fuels are being phased out. So it's, it will be jobs in the short run for Hammerfest, but whether those are sustainable jobs is another matter. I would underline that what we do, we build a platform we build infrastructure, we build competence for, to make sure that we can handle what comes in the future. And that's why the um, uh, LNG fabric has meant everything for us, because now we have the money, we have the people, we have the resources to pre be prepared for the future. And we will be part of the sustainable development. Okay. We, I want to just see, get a few more questions in before we finish, because we don't have that much longer, and I'm delighted to see there's questions over there, there's questions over there. So in the interest of gender balance, which is important, I'm going to have you, sir, and then you, ma'am, first. So, um, yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Tom Huntley, and I'm a U.S. Coast Guard uh, helicopter pilot, currently on a one-year uh, fellowship at Princeton, studying Arctic policy. But prior to here, uh, I was in Kodiak, Alaska, and I did a lot of rescues in the Arctic. Mm. And I want to get to some of the points that, that were made <clears throat> about the lack of infrastructure and, and specifically to the villages that aren't ripe for investment. Um, you know, the, the town of Shishmaref is falling into the ocean. Mm -hmm. I've done rescues in, on St. Lawrence Island that are directly related to climate change. And these communities, while they're very resilient and very adaptable, uh, as was brought up earlier, the change is so rapid, I, and I don't know how we can make the required investment. I guess my question is, how do we as a global community recognize these small communities that, uh, that need our help, um, but the difficulty in uh, either in a response and a rescue standpoint or in a longer term investment um, right. where, where they're not, you know, the, the centers for oil and gas or fisheries or right. other investment. Yeah. Good question. I mean, small communities, not necessarily in places which are going to attract a massive amount of private sector investment for exploration or whatever. Uh, what, 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 what's the solution for them if, if they are facing emergencies uh, caused by rising sea levels and climate change? Is it to accept that they have no future? Is it to move them? Is it, I don't know, to build massive defenses? What is it? Well, I think it starts by looking back at uh, the, frankly, the previous question that was just asked about how do we, how do we think about communities, um, making sure that we have a very expansive view of that. And then also on that same theme, kind of thinking about the Arctic, not just as an Arctic where we have um, hydrocarbon exploration and extraction, or just fisheries, or just tourism, um, but thinking about it as a community where, where people live, you know? And, and I actually believe that there is much more we can do to consider what is the, the, the large 
number of different types of needs and think through then, as a from a pan-Arctic perspective, what types of plans do we need to put in place to build the right infrastructure to meet some of these these um, vulnerable situations so we don't uh, end up in a situation that you just described where you're trying to conduct rescues where there there is very little or no infrastructure, or you have a community that is making decisions about moving further inland, potentially, because their um, their coastline is eroding. Mm. But whatever the solutions are, they're going to involve significant resources. They are. For, for relatively small numbers of people. But one does it if one believes that this is important for the idea, you know, for the, for the very sort of fabric of the Arctic. Um, I, I, I just would like to respond quickly to the, to the Shishmarev issue that you brought up. I, for a number of years, I've been working w with the community there as well. And, and I think in Shishmarev and a number of other um, northern communities, you, you need to also think about the history. You know, it's a colonial history where, you know, where the people of Shishmarev live today. That was not their choice. It was the U.S. government who put the school and the, and the church and the post office there. <laughs> It was not a forced relocation there, but you know, if you require people to send their children to school, you, you mm. more or less force them. So, because the elders there always knew that this is not a place to live. This is a, a, a barrier island that is that is kind of you know even before the current onset of climate change that was not a place to live and so there was it was seasonally used before and so I think th there you have a slightly different situation than w when you have somewhere in Florida a community of um, rich people who now have to relocate because of of, of 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 rising sea levels so I think we need to keep that in mind also how these individual communities got to where they are now yeah interesting uh, I, I want to bring in the lady. There was a question over here, uh, you, ma'am, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Marianne, you made a point about cross-border mobility and talent retention as a way to mitigate the population decline. And Tromsø has a role to play as the Arctic capital and as the host of the university um, and the Arctic Council. I work for the international school here, which is full and which does not offer upper secondary education. So on a weekly basis, we talk to people who have a job offer in Tromsø and who decide not to take it because there is no education for their children. Because when you come here as a knowledge worker on a short-term contract, you do not want to go into a local school where you spend two years learning the, the language before you start learning. So to mitigate this, we need to focus on international education, especially in the hubs in the Arctic. Thank you. I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> of course, educational institution, also international education in our region is very important. That's what the young people want as well. They want to have contact with the rest of the world. And if they can stay in smaller places and still feel that they are close to the world, I think that's a part of the It is interesting to me that you very much feel that, that, that you know, the desire of, of uh, let's face it, transient workers to have their kids educated in English it needs, you know, you guys to adapt rather than to expect them to adapt to just chuck their kids into Norwegian school and get on with it. You, you, it it's in, in a funny sort of way, as we've been talking about the, the importance of, of uh, an Arctic identities and Arctic communities and Arctic history and culture, the, the danger might be that you end up with a deeply sort of anglicized, globalized I mean, mush of a, of a culture. <laughs> is that, a da you know, is that actually a danger? In, no, it's in, not danger. Uh, Let's welcome the world and let them come to us. Right. Instead and, of sending but our also, kids. But also, but be very true and proud to your history and of identity. Of course, always. N yes. Never. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, or we'll just try to squeeze one more in if it's brief. If there is one more person who would like to ask a question. It is. Yes. Well, actually, oh dear. Well, I. Uh, you are, you're so polite, sir. You've given the last question away to the lady over there. Yeah. Ma'am, you get the last question. Go on. Uh, it's not more a question, but um, I'm from the Northwest Arctic Borough. I'm the mayor. Uh, we have about 7,800 folks that live in Northwest Arctic, about 85% Inupiaq, which is uh, Eskimo. Um, I happen to be part Swede. Hello. <laughs> I'm a long ways from home. But I, I want to echo on Peter's um, uh, discussions on the Arctic. Uh, we have a community called Kivalina that um, we're President Obama came up to Kotzebue and put Kivalina on the map, and Kivalina was eroding. We, you know, we want to be a re resilient community or a resilient Arctic up in the Northwest Arctic, 
but it, it, it takes partnership. What, what the Northwest Arctic ha Borough had to do was partner. Um, it took 37 years for the state and federal folks to look at us and build a Cape Blossom Road, which will event eventually build a port so that we could lower the cost of living and decrease the use of fossil fuels. We've done a lot of renewable energy, the solar panels, the solar arrays, the, the windmills. Um, but I think, um, I guess, how could we, we travel to Juneau, we travel to DC, we say what we feel, we really need the help. Uh, what more can we do to get that help to build resiliency in Northwest Arctic? Okay, I'm gonna, thank you. And I'm proud to say I've been to Kivalina actually, so uh, that I can totally relate to what you're saying. You're gonna have to be very quick because we're out of time, so. Uh, do I, do I, you know, I can only say, well, I guess uh, this, 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 is, this, this, this is a challenge um, for Kivalina and many other Arctic communities, and unfortunately, I don't have the solution for that. You don't, but yeah. the work you're doing perhaps guides people who do have the power. Yeah, to but in, 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 in academics, we have wise words, but the, well. the, the, the power is elsewhere, yeah. Yes, uh, I suppose that's true. It doesn't mean you should stop your work, though, because it is very important. Um, okay, we are out of time. The red button is flashing, which means I've failed in my timekeeping, but not too badly. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I and the panel are going to depart now, and I'm going to hand over to Uli for the next uh, important piece of, of ceremonial. Uh, but, but before I go and the panel goes, please give all of my panelists a very big thank you. Thank you, panel, very much indeed. We must now leave. Thank you.